Hey guys, this episode is an introduction to AI and behavior trees in Unreal Engine 5. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode, and today we are finally starting on AI. Now by the end of the episode, we are going to have an AI character. It's not going to be all that sophisticated, but at least it's going to be able to play a combination of tag and hide and go seek. And to be honest, not all that well. But that's because this is the first of what are going to be many, many episodes on AI. Because as you can imagine, doing a good AI in a game, that's probably the most sophisticated, most complex, most difficult part of any game. But this episode right here is just an introduction. It's going to be all about the functionality, the basic bits and pieces, that we're going to use to put our AI together. And not until a number of episodes down the line are we going to get into the complexity of how an AI should really behave depending on the goals of the AI. And at this stage of our series, I thought about going into more gameplay abilities, but I realized that we have a short range attack, that's our flamethrower. We have a long range attack, that's our fireball. And we have an escape mechanism, which is our speed boost jump ability. And in my mind, that's enough at least to put together some AI behavior trying to incorporate all of those abilities. So the goal now is to make this AI character playable, at least in terms of an ad adversary character that we can play against, and then from there we're going to expand into more abilities. Before we get into it though, there are some key terms and how those terms are related that I want to make sure you understand. So a pawn is an actor that can be an agent in the world. So all characters in some regard are pawns. And pawns can be possessed by a controller, so what is actually controlling that character? Think of that pawn as the physical representation of that agent in the game, but then the controller, that's the soul of the character. And you can have two types of controllers, right? You have player controllers, that's you, and you have AI controllers, and that's what we're going to set up this episode. And both of these slides here come from a presentation on Unreal Engine AI that I strongly recommend you check out. It's about 30 minutes long, but it's a good overview. So the behavior tree and the blackboard, those are brand new things. So the behavior tree is how our AI is actually acting in the world. It's basically the mind of our AI. And then the blackboard is the memory. So what are all the pieces of data that our AI is factoring in to make decisions during the game? And the only part of this diagram I don't really like are the tasks, because the tasks are basically incorporating both the memory pieces and updating those memory pieces, but they're also being used by the brain. So it's almost like a triangle of those three things. And think of the tasks as the individual components, the individual actions that the brain is taking. So as you can imagine, we have a ton of new concepts this episode that we haven't covered before in this series. And although this is just an introductory episode to AI, we're going to do so many episodes coming up on AI that all of these are going to be second nature by the time you're through them. The only two concepts in here that aren't directly related to AI are the tags and the validated get. So tags are just a way of categorizing certain actors or components in a certain way. So if we want to get all actors of class, instead of doing it that way, you can do it by tag. In the validated get, you'll see where this comes into play, but throughout this series we're doing a ton of is valid checks, and the validated get is just an easier way to do those is valid checks. So this is a long episode, it's detailed, but you're going to have all the basics by the end of it. So let's get to it. So to start our episode today, I'm just going to backtrack and go over what we did two episodes ago in episode 45. And that's when we set up a metahuman character to be playable based on our third person character template. So the way we did that is we created a new BP adversary AI character. And our parent class for that is BP third person character. And it's pretty much a standard third person character except it's mapped to our metahuman. And the big difference is that we're retargeting our animations in real time back to the third person character. So the way we do that, let me just show you that. So if I select body here, our anim class is ABP adversary AI character and that's this ABP adversary AI character here and we're just retargeting pose from mesh we're using our RTG mannequin asset and the reason I'm showing you this is because you can go back to that episode and recreate exactly what we got here or you could create a child class of your third person character blueprint and just start with that but regardless you're going to need a new character class in order to have an AI character so ours is going to be this the adversary AI and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to right click create a new folder and simply call it AI and I'm going to do this right in our core folder because it's going to be core to the game we're making. And I'll right click on that and I'll give it kind of an alarming orange color. And then I'll move in our blueprint. So our ABP and then our regular character blueprint, move those right in, move here. Next, we got to reverse something we did two episodes ago, and we mainly did this to test our metahuman facial animations, but now we're going to go back into our third person game mode here, and I'm going to change our default pawn class to be back to our third person character, so BP third person character, compile and save, and we can close out of that, and I'll close out of both of these too. So at this point, go ahead and hit play and just make sure that your third person character is functional, that you can use all your gameplay abilities, that everything's still working exactly as you anticipate. So next, you heard me say on the intro, we got a completely different controller for our AI compared to our player character. So let's go back into our content drawer into our AI folder. We're going to right click here. We're going to create a new blueprint class. And if I search here for AI controller, and there it is, AI controller is our parent class. Select. 
and I'm gonna name this the Adversary AI Controller. But you can name this whatever you like if you're not following this series. And now we have to go into our Adversary AI character and connect up our controller to the character. So let's go into that. And if you go into your class defaults here, this is where the controller is set. So in the details panel, if I search for controller, and we've got our AI controller class here, and I'm just going to switch this to our new one, adversary AI controller. And the next thing we have to do is we have to get a reference to our controller on begin play. We've got to update our references relative to the parent blueprint. So what I can do is I can get the controller here, get controller. And from here, I can cast to our new adversary AI controller class, connect this up. And then from as adversary AI controller, I can right click promote to variable and I'll just go ahead and rename this. This is going to be our AI controller reference. And I'll comment these three to that effect. So AI controller reference. But now we've got to clean up some things on event begin play. And if you're not following along with this series, a lot of what I'm about to do probably isn't going to be relevant to you, but some of it probably still is. So for example, you still have a third person camera if you copied from your third person character blueprint. And we don't want that camera ticking and basically taking up system resources as our AI is playing because there's no reason to, it's an AI character. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here on our event graph. I'm gonna get a reference to both our first person follow camera. And we set this up in episode five of this series. It was way back. And also our third person follow camera. Camera. And for both of these, I'm just going to drag out a pin and say set active. And we're going to set both of them to be active false and then connect this up. Just going to duplicate it one more time. Connect this one up here. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get a reference to both of these again. And we're going to set tick to be disabled. So there's a set tick enabled, set component tick enabled. And that's going to be false. And that way neither camera is ticking when this character is active. And I'll do the same thing over here, set component tick enabled. And the reason I'm keeping our two cameras is because I do want to be able to actually possess our AI characters just to follow them around and watch their behavior. So eventually we are going to need to be able to activate these cameras, just not initially. All right, so I could zoom out a little bit and I'll just comment all of this and I'll put in a comment that says disable cameras on AI characters for performance. So we'll compile and save that. And then let's open up our third person character blueprint because there are a few other things on event begin play that quite frankly, we shouldn't call on our AI characters. So if I go all the way up here to event begin play, because over here we do a few things we don't need for our AI characters. So for example, we don't need to create a HUD. We just want one HUD, one for our player character. We don't need a character heartbeat. So we're not going to hear that unless it's our own heartbeat. So what I'm going to do is back in our adversary AI character, I'm not going to call the parent function here. I'm going to delete this out. And I'm also going to delete these two events here. And then I'm going to create some space because we have to call the specific things we need from our parent event. So I'll go back to third person character. We need our anim BP reference still. So I'm going to copy those four and I'll copy that and bring them over here. Paste. So connect this up, comment those. This is our anim BP reference. And then I'll connect from here. I'll connect up to this. And then at the very end of this chain, there are just three functions that we need. So we do need our increment health recovery function. And that's what we set up in episode 42. And then our next one we set up last episode, that's a random blinking. And then a final one was episode 44, our physical animation episode. And for that, we need a reference to our physical animation component. And then we'll drag out a pin and say set skeletal mesh component. And that's going to be our mesh. So connect this up just like this, connect this up here. And just like we did on our third person character. So I'm gonna comment all of these and these are all things for a living creature. So I'm just gonna title this instantiation of a living being. Compile and save. All right, so we are almost ready to put our AI character into the world. But before that, our AI needs something to be able to navigate around in our level. And that's what's called a nav mesh. So I can search down here in this drop down for nav and I need to get a nav mesh bounds volume. And what I typically do here is I put it directly in the center of our map. So location zero, zero, zero. And it's all the way over there. I'm going to zoom over there. And then from that position, I'm going to make the scale 5Z. So a little bit higher. And that's because our landscape is changing elevation slightly. And then for the X and Y of the scale. So my level is quite massive because I'm pushing my GPU to the max. But we're going to make that 140 by 140. And you should see that this green update occurs all over the land. And what the nav mesh is doing is it's basically figuring out for that entire space, is our character, our AI character, going to be able to walk and run and move onto those areas. And one quick thing to know about the nav mesh is pressing P just toggles the display on and off so you can get a sense of those areas that are filled by the nav mesh. So now that we have a nav mesh, we have a space where our AI character is going to be able to navigate. So we can pull in our AI character. So I'm going to go pretty close to my player start here. 
Go back to our content drawer under AI and just drag in our BP adversary character. So now we've got our AI character in the world, but it's not gonna do anything yet. Why? Because we haven't given it memory yet, we haven't given it a brain yet, a mind, and we haven't told it anything to do. So we're gonna start with the memory, and that's our blackboard. So we have to define what variables, what things our AI is actually going to care about, at least initially in this prototype. So we'll go over to our content drawer and right click over here, and under artificial intelligence, we're gonna choose blackboard. And I'm gonna name this BB for blackboard adversary AI. And we'll go into that. Now the blackboard is literally just a list of variables and those are defined by what are called keys here. And for our AI, we gotta figure out what is our AI going to care about? So obviously it's going to care about where's our character, but there are other things it's going to care about. So our AI is going to need gameplay abilities. Our AI is going to need a patrol and look for stuff. So it needs locations, which are vectors. It's also gonna care whether or not it has a target, which is an actor. It's also gonna care, does it have line of sight or is it hearing its target, which are going to be Booleans. And the number of variables that we're gonna have on this blackboard, it's going to get more and more sophisticated, more and more complex as we build through this series. But we're gonna keep this very simple to start. We're gonna create three new keys. So the first one, this is gonna be an object because our very first one is going to be our target. So current target. And I'm gonna use underscores as delimiters for pieces of information in these variables because I'm anticipating that the very first piece of information in these variables to keep track of them is whether or not this is a current piece of data or a historical piece of data. And this isn't going to be relevant for this episode, but in the future, our character is going to need to be sophisticated enough to know, okay, previously, historically, the character was here, headed in this direction, and keep track of that data. So even if it doesn't know something currently, it has a memory in the past. So I'm just denoting with this variable here that it's the current target. And over here on the right-hand side for this key, this variable, we've got our details panel. And if I expand the key type, I could say the base class of this, not gonna be object, it's going to be an actor. And the reason I'm selecting actor here is because our current target could be the player, but it could be another character. It could be a gameplay ability that's kind of there, ready to be picked up in the world. So I want our AI to be adaptable enough that it can have a different target, what its main aim is at any given time. In this instant sync checkbox, we're not gonna check that, but basically what that means is if you wanted multiple characters that were using this Blackboard to all use the same exact variable at any given time. So if they were all, for example, like a hive mind being controlled by one thing, focusing on one target, then this instant sync variable would make sense. Then we're gonna do another new key, and this one's gonna be a bool, and this one's gonna be current, again, it's current data, target has line of sight. And this is simply gonna indicate, does our AI currently have line of sight on our target? And one last new key, so this is going to be, if I scroll down a little bit, a vector. And this is gonna be, again, current data, movement goal location. But I'm gonna specify for this, this is our movement goal location without a target, because if we have a target, it's just gonna to move directly towards the target. So now that we have the building blocks of our AI's memory, now we can begin putting together its mind. And that's gonna be built in what's called a behavior tree. So to create a new behavior tree, we're gonna go back to our content drawer and we'll right click and under AI, new behavior tree. And we'll name this BT underscore adversary AI, and BT for behavior tree. And double click to go into that. And in the details panel over here on the right, we see that it already assigned our blackboard because we only have one blackboard. And you can always get to the blackboard that's attached to the behavior tree right here on the right. And then back to the behavior tree. So the behavior tree, it consists of three parts. So on the left here, we have our overall tree, and this is going to lay out the logic of how our character is going to behave. And on the right-hand side, we have our details panel. So any of the nodes for our logic, we're going to update them in the details panel. And then the bottom right-hand corner, we have our blackboard, and that's all of our variables. So we're gonna take a root node here, drag out a pin downward, and we're actually gonna create a new root node. I think of this as a root node, and it's called a selector node. And we see that when we drag out here, we have three options, selector, sequence, and simple parallel. And there's a really good explanation of all these nodes on the behavior tree quick start guide, and there's a link to it in the description below. And we're starting with the selector node in our case because it's basically going to go down one main path and do everything under that path. We're gonna use these two this episode. We're not yet gonna use simple parallel, but I actually have something in mind in the future that I think simple parallel is gonna be the right way to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the name of this selector node. So this is actually going to be our adversary underscore AI root because this is really the root of our tree. And then from this root, we're going to have two primary primary subtrees that we're gonna set up this episode. So the first one, if I drag out to the left, so under this, under composites, now we're going to do a sequence. And this sequence I'm gonna title chase target. And this is the sequence of events that when our AI actually has a target, it's going to execute those in order. And you see here, now we have numbers in the top right corner of each node. And that tells you the order in which these are executing. So first it's starting at zero, then going to one. And these nodes execute from top to bottom and then left to right. 
and then we're going to have another sequence if we don't have a target and that one we're going to title patrol and that one's going to have our AI look around until it finds a target the last thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a third node and basically all this is going to do is tell our AI to wait and it's going to wait for one second so not five seconds here I'm just going to say one second and that's just a way of giving it a very slight delay before it goes through this entire tree again so it's always going to try to chase target first and if it doesn't have a target then it's going to patrol and then it's going to wait once it hits its patrol destination but it's only going to get to its patrol destination if it doesn't get a target during its patrol and that's the benefit of a selector node is that we can interrupt something that's going on in one of the lesser priority nodes if something that's higher priority gets triggered and you'll notice that this wait node is purple and that just means it's a task node it's actually executing something and there are a number of tasks that are standard so if I drag out here and I can search under tasks so these are all the standard tasks but as we're building out our AI in more complex fashion over time we're going to use more and more custom tasks so now let's set up our chase target sequence. So I'll come down here, drag out a pin, and under tasks, the very first thing it's going to do is it's going to rotate to face the target. And that's our blackboard entry. But as it currently stands, it's rotating to the self, self actor. So we don't want that. So instead, we're going to change the blackboard key here to our current target. And we could also choose a vector here. So we could rotate toward a location as well. But in this case, we're rotating toward the current target actor that we set up on our blackboard. And we could change the node name here, but typically I wouldn't recommend that for a standard task. That way you know it's a standard task. And precision just means how close it needs to rotate to meet its target. So you see the success condition, precision in degrees. So it could be 10 degrees off to the left or right. And so next we're gonna move to our target. So once we rotate, then we're gonna do another task and this is going to be a move to task. And once again, we have to update our blackboard key, what we're moving to, that's gonna be the current target. And for the acceptable radius, I can keep this five. So the acceptable radius as it stands, it includes the agent radius. So that's basically the capsule of our AI character, but then also the goal radius. So that would be the capsule of our player in this case. And the other thing I like doing here is checking off the observed blackboard value. And what that's going to do is if the goal changes, so basically if the current target changes in any regard, then this is gonna be updated to move to that location. So now I'm gonna move this out a little bit just so that it's in line with these two because we need a lot of space for our patrol. So now let's set up the patrol sequence. So for this, we need a task for picking a random location for our character to patrol to. But here's the problem. If I expand tasks, there's no get random location to patrol to task. There's nothing like that. So this is the first case where we have to create a new task. So let's come up here to our new task. And when we select that, it automatically expands the folder in which our behavior tree lives. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna right click, we're gonna create a new folder, and I'm just gonna call it BT tasks. And I'll go into BT tasks, and I'll name this BT task underscore select patrol location. And that's gonna open up our new task. So if I go back to our content drawer, you'll find it right here. So now that we have our new task, it's not doing anything yet, but now that we have it, let's go back to our behavior tree and let's hook it up. So under tasks here, I can now see BT tasks select patrol location. And one little aesthetic thing I do, I try to make sure tasks that are associated with the same subtree are very close together. And then I space them out a little bit compared to other tasks and other trees. Doesn't matter right now, but once this tree gets a lot bigger, it'll matter. So this task is going to actually select the location that we're going to move to. And it's going to do that by updating this key right here, the vector that we created. But then once it updates that, then we can do a move to task. So I'll do a move to right here. And for what we're moving towards, that's going to be our blackboard key, our current movement goal location without a target. And then once our AI character actually reaches that location, so I'm going to create some more space here, I'm going to have it actually wait. And we're going to do another wait. And this one, I'm going to randomize the wait time a little bit. So it's gonna be one second with a random deviation of, let's say like two seconds. So it'll be one second plus or minus two seconds, anywhere from zero to three seconds. And so now the framework of our behavior tray is complete. So the next thing we've gotta do is update this task, the BT task select patrol location. And with all these behavioral tree tasks, there's six overridable functions. So you receive abort, receive abort AI, execute, execute AI. And I don't anticipate we're going to use the events that don't have AI in the name because the AI ones are what's actually received from the behavior tree. So receive execute AI would be whenever this particular task gets executed, basically gets hit in the behavior tree. And abort, it's whenever it gets interrupted. And then tick would be as that node in the behavior tree is active, every tick. So in our case, what we care about is receive execute AI. So I'll select that. The very first thing we have to do is from our owner controller, we have to get the blackboard because we basically have to get a blackboard reference from this task. And then from this, I can promote this to a variable and I'll connect this up and I'll call this our blackboard reference. So right click here, blackboard reference. And so now we got to get a random patrol location for our AI. So from the controlled pawn, which is our AI character, I can drag out a pin, I can get our actor location, 
And then from our actor location, I can drag out and say, get random reachable point in radius. And it says, generates a random location reachable from a given origin location. And that location is wherever our AI character is currently. And then the radius, I'll promote this to a variable, and that way we can adjust it in the task itself. So for example, when we get to more sophisticated AI behavior, if the AI suspects that the character is on the other side of the map, I could set this radius to be something very far, so that way it can go much further. And what I'll do is I'll change this name. I'm just going to rename it to Patrol radius. Now for the nav data and filter class, we're not going to cover that this episode. Basically, as it currently stands, it's going to look at the entire nav volume, basically the entire space of the nav mesh, but it is possible to filter that down to say, okay, only patrol in this particular area, that particular area, and that's where you'd use these. All right, so the next thing is if we get a random reachable point, so if we successfully get a point that's reachable, then we're going to do a branch. And what that means then is we can set our blackboard value. So I can get a reference to our blackboard, get, and then from that, I can set value as, and you see all the different types of values that we can set, but ours is going to be a vector because it's a patrol location. And I'll connect it up here. And then we also need to give this a key name, and that's going to be whatever we named it in our Blackboard. So that's going to be this current movement goal location. So I can rename, copy that, I'm not actually going to rename it, but that way I can come back here and we can make literal name. And then we can connect that up to the key name like this and paste that in here. And that's taking up a lot of space, so I'm going to drag this over. And you got to make sure that those key names are verbatim, because if you get that off, it's not going to update. But I'm going to show you how you can troubleshoot that in just a little bit. And so we can get our random location here and connect that up. And I'm just going to add a reroute right here. And the last thing we need to do is at the end of every string, we need to have what's called a finish execute node. So this is basically telling the behavior tree, okay, we finished, go on to the next node. And this is going to be successful. But if we do not get a random reachable point, then it's not going to be successful. So we'll connect this up to the false. So our task setup is complete here. So now we've got to hook up our behavior tree to the AI controller. So let's compile and save. Let's go back to our content drawer. We'll go into our adversary AI controller. And I'm going to open the full blueprint editor here. I can delete out the event begin play and event tick. And instead, we're going to right click and say event on possess. So this one right here. And that just means whenever this controller is possessed, it's going to do something. And what it's going to do is run behavior tree. And we're going to hook up our behavior tree. So BT adversary AI. Now there's a few other things that we've got to do here to get this up and running. So we need to add what's called a perception component. So if we go to add here and we search for perception, AI perception. So this AI perception component, it basically receives stimuli. So is our AI going to be able to hear? Does it see? What's the radius that it sees? Can it see behind itself? Can it see only in a small cone? So all of those senses are going to be tied into this AI perception component. So anytime the AI needs to perceive something going on in the world or with itself, then it's going to run through here. And for this episode, we're just going to set up AI sight. And in a couple of episodes, we're going to do AI hearing as well. And of course, we're going to get to damage and all that stuff. So under AI perception over here, I'm just going to hit plus sign. And we're going to choose for our first index, we're going to choose AI site config. And this is the default setup for our AI being able to sense what's in front of it via site. If I expand this and I expand sense, then I have all the details of how it registers site. So the peripheral vision half angle degrees. So this is kind of what angle can it see? And it's a half angle. So as it currently stands, it's actually going to look in a 180 degree arc. The site radius is the furthest distance away that you can notice a target. And then the lose site radius is if you already have a target and it's running away, how far does it have to get to lose sight? So feel free to play with these, but we're going to keep them just as is. And by the way, I should mention there's great documentation on AI perceptions. Very robust, very comprehensive. I recommend checking all this out because it's a lot more detail than I'm going to give you in this episode. But here's where we're going to start with the AI site. So down here under events, and I know you can't really see this, so I'm going to expand this out just a little bit so then we can see it just for now. So if I hover over on target perception updated, this is what we're going to use. Notifies all bound objects that perception info has been updated for a given target. And so if our character runs into the radius by which it can be seen, then this is going to fire. So I'll hit the plus sign here, and then I can just decrease the size of this. So we have our actor and we have our stimulus. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to check to see, OK, is the actor that just updated our target perception, is that a player? So to do that, we are going to use what's called a tag. So we can select the actor has tag here, and the tag we're going to use is player. And tags are just a way of specifying, OK, this actor is of this type. And then also, and I don't really understand why this is the case, because if this is triggered, then you think it would already be successfully sensed because it's already triggered. 
But what we have to do is we have to break the AI stimulus here and we have to drag out from the successfully sensed here. And if anyone knows the difference between this being triggered and successfully sensed here, I would really like to know that. But the guides recommend that we do both of these things. So we're going to do both. So we're going to do an and statement and Boolean. Connect this up here. Connect this one up there. And then from this, we're going to branch. Connect this up. And when this occurs, that's when it's going to set our new target on our Blackboard. But before we do that, we're going to create a brand new function that over some period of time after successfully being sensed, it's going to clear that actor from our Blackboard. Because you got to think of it this way. If our AI character sees our player and then the player goes out of their perception, there's got to be some period of time where after that period of time, it should go back to patrolling. So realistically, the AI is not going to be able to follow our player indefinitely if our player is out of sight. So to handle that, we'll create a new function here called clear sensed target. And then I'll move over here just a little bit. So we have to get our blackboard to start. So instead of this get blackboard, you have to come down to the bottom, get blackboard here, because this is our actual blackboard that's assigned to our controller. And then from here, we're going to set value as bool. And then I'll connect this up. And then from the key name, we can make a literal name. And I'll go over to our blackboard here. And from here, we'll get our Boolean. And I'll just copy that name. We'll go back to our controller. And I'll paste that in here. And our bool value here is going to be false. Because whenever this function gets called on our AI, that basically means our AI no longer has line of sight. And then we're going to replicate both of these. And then from the blackboard over here, we're going to set value as object. And the reason we're doing a set value as object is because we need to clear a different value. We need to clear our current target. So once again, I can get the name of that. So current target back to our controller. And this key name is going to be current target. Connect this up. And for the object value, it's just going to be null. It's going to be blank. All right, we have our function. So let's go back to the event graph. So the way this is going to work is that whenever on target perception is updated as player, like whenever this is true, then it's going to start a countdown. And if that countdown is met, then it's going to call the clear sense target function. Basically, it's going to require the AI to continue having line of sight in order to continue pursuing our player. So in order to reset the timer whenever this is called, so whenever this is true, then we are going to clear a timer by function name. And we haven't even set our timer for calling the clear sensed function, but we will. So I'm just going to get our name here, paste that into the function name here. And then after this, I'm going to go back to our clear sense target function because I'm going to get both of these, go back to our event graph, paste them in. And here, instead of being null references, so they're going to be true for the bool. And then this is going to be our player. But in order to be our player, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get our sensed actor right here and connect it up. And so I'll click this to add a reroute, move it down here. Same thing right over here. And one more reroute. And then after we set both of these to be true, meaning we successfully sensed our player, then we have to start our timer for the clear sense target. So I'll come over here to the right and we are going to set a timer by function name and our function name is going to be the same thing. Clear sensed target. Don't set it to looping. And for our time here, it's really up to you. I think what I'm going to do for now is promote this to a variable and I'll rename this over here. I'll just call it line of sight timer. I'm going to compile and save, and then I'm going to set this to four seconds. But really, you can set this for as long as you like. And what this amount of time is going to determine is how long our AI character can be without line of sight before it loses our target and goes into patrol. The one thing we got to change here is under detection by affiliation, expand that and make sure to check off this detect neutrals. So as it currently stands, our player character is going to be labeled neutral. And there's not a way in blueprints, this is disappointing, but there's not a way in blueprints of labeling actors as enemies neutrals friendly so we just have to label everything as neutrals and then use the actor as tag here to differentiate so let's compile and save this we are all set for our ai controller and we just have a few more settings before we can test this so the first thing is let's go back to our third person character because on here we actually have to set a tag of player as it currently stands it's not labeled as a player so if i search under details make sure you have the root component selected and then if i search for tag i can add a tag here and just make sure you get that verbatim player with capital p and with that in there that just means our adversary ai controller so this will actually work so let's compile and save that and then there's one more thing we need on our adversary ai character itself if you select the root component there's a setting under details for use controller rotation yaw make sure to select that and what this is going to do is basically adjust the character to be whatever direction the controller is moving it towards. So if you think about it from a camera standpoint, so you can actually turn your camera around your character typically if you're in third person view, but in first person view, you want this to be locked. So whatever direction you turn, your character actually turns. And it's the same thing for our AI character. We want the controller to be able to turn the character. 
So we'll compile and save this. And then we have to go back to our behavior tree. We're almost ready to test. So we need a mechanism to actually interrupt patrol and go over to chase target whenever our AI character actually spots our player. And the way we're going to do that is with something called a decorator. So if you right click on chase target, then we can add a decorator. And specifically, we're gonna add a blackboard decorator. And this is also on the quick start guide. I strongly encourage you to check it out, but we've got decorators and services. So decorators are conditionals. They attach to another node and they make decisions on whether that node can be taken. We're not gonna do services this episode, but we will do them in the future. So what we're going to do with our blackboard based condition is we're basically going to say, okay, if our current target has line of sight switches over to true, then interrupt whatever's going on and go right over to move to that current target. So to do that, we're gonna select that blackboard base condition right there in the middle. And then on observer aborts here, we're gonna select both. So this just means when our blackboard value changes, it's going to abort everything. And that value is only gonna change after four seconds of no AI perception line of sight because we've got our timer for four seconds. So the next thing is we gotta adjust our blackboard key because what we're focused on is the current target has line of sight. And I'm just gonna update the node name to has line of sight to target. So only if this is true, so only if this particular blackboard key is set, meaning current target has line of sight set to true, then it does this sequence of events because it's a sequence node. And the aborts just means it's gonna interrupt anything else going on in the tree. If we wanted to only abort lower priority stuff, I could change this to just lower priority. So we are finally ready to test this. Let's save this, make sure you compiled and saved everything and let's test. So as we go about testing this, you're gonna see that there's a number of things that straight up are not working properly. But I wanna go through all the techniques that I use for troubleshooting AI. So the first thing is get your behavior tree up like I do here. Typically I'd have this on a second screen, but just in this case, it's gonna be on our screen right here. So we could see that our behavior tree at least is working. It's firing, but whenever it's hitting BT task select patrol location, it is failing immediately and go right back to waiting. And the reason that that's happening, as I see here, it says current movement goal location without a target currently invalid. And that's why it's not moving to that location. It doesn't have a target location to move to. But let's test out the has line of sight to target. So I'm gonna run over to our AI and see if it catches me in line to say, all right, so it's moving towards me. And it's not at all freaky as he's gliding towards me. So obviously something's not right here because the animation isn't playing. We want our character to be animated properly as he's moving. But before that, let's figure out what's going on with our BT task select patrol location. So if I navigate over to the task here and you'll see an option on the right here and you can expand it if it's hidden but this is actually what's simulating in our blueprint here and we see that as it's going it's always going to false here and the reason is that we never set a patrol radius so it's trying to patrol zero units and obviously that's failing so I'm going to change our default patrol radius to something like 1000 units and we'll test this again all right, so we see it hitting the true branch successfully. So now we know it is reaching that part of our behavior tree and we see it actually moving there in the distance. Now his animation still isn't occurring. I saw a little bit of a jump there, but he just spotted us because we came within line of sight and now he's moving towards us. So let's solve the animation issue and then we'll go from there. So let's go back to our third person character blueprint and specifically let's go back to the event graph. So if we come up in our event graph, we got to go to our movement input. So our input axis move forward, backward, add movement input because this movement input node, this is what's actually driving our ground speed. Without this, there's nothing being fed into our animation blueprint that's telling our character, okay, you're going this fast and then animate accordingly. So here's what we're going to do to address this. So back in our adversary AI character. So I'm gonna come down underneath our event begin play, and then we're gonna search for event tick. And from event tick, I'm going to assess every single tick, whether or not we need to add movement input. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna start by getting a reference to our character movement component. And from this, I'm gonna get the velocity of our character. So how quickly is it moving? get velocity. And specifically, I just want the X and Y so I can get the vector length X and Y. And if this is greater than three, and I'll explain why I'm setting this threshold at three, but let's just do this for now. So we need to branch, connect this up. If it's greater than three, that means our character is moving. And then what I can do from the true branch here, I can add movement input but we gotta figure out, okay, what's our world direction? So for that, I can use the same exact logic that we have here. So I can get our control rotation, get forward vector, and I can copy both of these nodes in here, and then connect this up just like this, because it's based on our Z. It's based on this axis here, which way we're rotated. So I'm just gonna move these in a little bit, move these over, move this over, compile and save, and let's test this again. So what we should see is our character should be actually animating in whatever direction, there we go. 
But now we get our very first blueprint issue, and you may see other issues. It's very inconsistent as to what triggers when. And so we're going to go through and we're going to resolve each of these. But before we do that, I just want to explain why I set the threshold there to be three. So if we go over to our animation blueprint, so if I go back to our core folder, our third person character ABP, basically what I'm doing in setting that threshold to three is based on the event graph here. And this is in the default third person character animation blueprint. It says set should move to true only if ground speed is above a very small threshold to prevent incredibly small velocities from triggering animations. And so Unreal Engine by default sets that threshold at three. So I figure it might as well mimic theirs. And so if you're following along in this entire series, then you might have a series of runtime errors just like this. So these are inconsistent, and I'm not sure why they're all inconsistent, but we're going to fix each of these one by one. And all of these are due to things that we set up in previous episodes that are running on the third person character that we don't actually need to run on the AI adversary character. And so let's go one by one and we'll finish out the episode. And so the first thing is if our character runs over one of our gameplay ability pickups as it currently stands, it's not going to work because our character is using our adversary AI controller, which does not currently have any references to gameplay abilities. And so to fix that issue on our adversary AI character directly under event tick, I'm just going to expand interfaces here, pick up ability. Now we are going to have an episode coming up where we have to integrate our gameplay ability system with AI characters. But for now, what we're going to do is just right click implement event. And this is just going to be blank. And that way, if our AI character or runs over a gameplay ability pickup, nothing's going to happen right now. So the next issue we're going to fix is related to our post-process damage dynamic material. And you're only going to see this issue if your AI character somehow takes damage. But what's happening is in this particular function, so if I go there, so the AI character is using all the functions, all the blueprints set up from a third person character, right? And it has a pulse, but it's not creating a post-process damage dynamic material because obviously for an AI character, we're not going to have a screen post-process effect. And so because of that, when this timeline gets called, it errors out because it can't set that value. And there's something else related to this that I changed. So initially, I set this up on the construction script, and it just stopped working for me. I have no idea why. So I went over to our event graph, and instead, I put the function that we set up in episode 43 right here on event begin play. And again, this should not be put on our AI adversary character, just the main character, just our player character. But let's actually fix the issue where our AI character is then trying to reference this material. So if I zoom out on our event graph, back in episode 42 and 43, we created this damage event. So if we come down here, it's this event any damage. And if I come over to the right here, and this is where we set on our post-process damage dynamic material the value that we want to be reflected when we take damage. And what we're going to do, instead of just getting a direct reference to this, we're going to right click and we're going to convert this to a validated get. And what that does is it basically replaces the is valid function basically turns this into an executable so that we can make sure that there is a valid reference before it does the thing. And if it's valid, then we go here. And so what we can do, I'm just going to move this over, move this over. And if it's not valid, I'm just going to skip over those three nodes and go directly here. And I'll put in a couple of reroutes. You're probably wondering, Neil, we've been doing so many is valid checks and you didn't show us this validated get option. To be honest, I only found out about this a few weeks ago. And we also have to do the same exact thing in another function, and that's under health, our increment health recovery function. Because we do the same thing here as we recover health, we're updating our post-process damage dynamic material. So I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to make some space, move this over to the right, right-click on our variable, convert to validated get, connect this up here, connect is valid up here. And then for the is not valid, very simple. We just skip this one node right to there. I'll put in two reroutes. So we have one more of these, and that's for our player character heartbeat function. So I'll zoom into this middle piece here, and it's this pulse timeline that I mentioned earlier. So what I can do here is just get a reference to our post-process damage dynamic material. We're going to get, we're going to convert it to a validated get, and then we'll connect it up just like this. Is valid, connect this up just like this. Is not valid, over to here. And one more reroute. So we'll compile and save this, and let's test this again, make sure there are no more errors. And what I suggest doing is just have the simulation running for a long period of time, and then escape out and see if you get any errors. So guys, one really quick thing before we end the episode. So I noticed with our metahuman character that performance starts becoming a challenge, especially in my crazy level where I think I have something like 30 to 40 gigabytes of assets. And I stumbled across this post on the Unreal Engine forums, how to improve texture streaming GPU performance in UE5 over 20% increase on GPU memory. And this ended up making a big difference for me. So I wanted to show you that. Basically we changed the pool size VRAM percentage here from 70 to zero. And that means it's unlimited, that we can use unlimited VRAM in texture streaming. 
streaming. And so the way we set that up is under our UE 5.0 or 5.1 folder, whatever you're using here. And yours is probably located under C program files, Epic games like mine is, but find that folder. So I'm going to go into UE 5.1 and we have to go into our engine and then from engine, go into config and then config, go into windows. I assume if you're doing this on Mac, you would go into the Mac folder. And then we have to go into Windows Engine.ini. And I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. And it says here, pool size VRAM percentage is how much percentage of GPU dedicated virtual RAM should be used as a texture pool cache for streaming textures. And it says zero for unlimited streaming. And right now it's set to 70. So I'm going to change this to zero. And then file and save this. And then restart Unreal Engine and see the effect that it has. And after I did that, I found that I'm getting way fewer hitches in my game. I still get some hitches. You'll notice on the left-hand side here with the MetaHuman. But that's mainly because our level here is so ginormous, absolutely massive. And you'll also notice a number of features with our AI character that you don't have yet. And these are all things that are coming up in our series. We've got AI tracking in air, we've got AI crouching, we've got AI jumping. So I hope to see you there in the next episode.